Hello, I'm James Flotman with the Minnesota Space Grant, and I'd like to talk a little bit about APRS tracking, tracking of balloon flights using ham radio APRS devices. Um, what I have here, it's very small, is called a strato track. And this particular strato track has my call sign, and it's one of several that I own, so it actually has a separate number for each one. So this is number seven. Um, on the board here, I've written Strato Track, that's the name of the device. APRS is a ham radio format. So to purchase this device and operate it, you need a ham radio technician license. And the website I'm going to go to is called APRS.FI. Okay, so that's where you can see information that's generated by these devices. Let me tell you a little bit about this device. Basically, it has a GPS and it actually has several other sensors. It has a temperature sensor pressure sensor and also a voltage sensor so as to tell the voltage of its battery. It uses a AA battery. Make sure you use a lithium battery for cold temperature tolerances. And essentially the device is only about the size of the battery. So when I put the battery in, it doesn't really get any bigger. Um, it's intended to fly with these two. That's the up end. This one, that's the down end. And it's actually intended to fly not inside of a payload but rather just outside. So either strapped to a payload, possibly dangling from a parachute or even on a cord between payloads. Um, what I usually do when I fly these things is I'll use some tape to tape the battery in just to make sure it doesn't pop out at all. And then I will strap it to the outside of a payload in this configuration. And the flat side, I believe, is the side that's supposed to have the best view of the sky. So despite the fact that it's tempting to tape it flat side to a payload, it really is better to tape it flat side away from a payload so it has the best view. Um, the information from these on that website, APRS.fi, only lasts for a couple days. So I did a, a flight a couple days ago and the, the data is still there. So let me just show you a little bit about what kind of information can be uh, logged by this device, which is now on because the battery is in. If you want to see the information directly, you'll need a ham radio that's APRS enabled. These are actually fairly expensive. So nicely enough, ham radio operators, some of them at least, will take transmissions on this frequency. The frequency is 144.39 megahertz. All right. That is the frequency for APRS transmissions in the United States. And in much of the rest of the world, although Europe, for instance, uses a slightly different frequency. And luckily enough, this device knows where it is in the world. It's a GPS after all. And so it will automatically switch to the right frequency for its operating location. So um, if you're using a APRS enabled ham radio, you will tune it to 144.39, but then it has to listen for and decode the transmissions. And so a, a simpler ham radio won't be able to do this. On the other hand, ham radio operators, some of them, will post information that they pick up on this frequency to the internet onto APRS.fi, for instance. So once you're in the air and are within line of sight of one or more eye gates, then this thing will show up on the internet. But almost always, at least the way I fly, when I'm launching, I'm not within line of sight of any of these people. And if I land somewhere out in the boonies, I'm not line of sight. So you can't really use this internet tracking to find your device after it comes back down. That's where you need either a handheld radio or perhaps another device, a spot unit or some other satellite unit that will tell you where it's located even after it lands, even if it lands in a place that doesn't have a lot of services. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Share screen. And let me just open up a browser. So here's Chrome. And I have gone to the website I just mentioned, APRS.FI. In fact, just for fun, let me just start from zero. APRS.FI. Okay. When you open this up, it assumes that you're going to be looking at locational data. And so it asks you what call sign. In other words, what radio are you interested in? So remember I said that the radio on this particular radio, it had my call sign written on it, that was my choice. When you purchase this, you have to tell them your call sign, which means you can't purchase it if you don't have a call sign. But getting one is not bad. You just have to pass the APRS or the ham radio license, technician's license exam. 
So here we go, K, D, zero, A, W, K, that's me. And I'm gonna look at dash two. It's a different radio than this one, but it's one that flew recently. And if I say search, it concedes that it knows that this radio was in use a couple days ago. Um, and it shows what is actually the tail end of a flight. And the reason is I only asked it for the last one hour of data. So let me actually see if I can get the last six hours worth of data from this device. Aha, so there is in fact the whole flight. This particular flight was launched from Wasika, Minnesota. It landed south of Claremont, Minnesota. This is a balloon flight. And these are towns south of Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities. Okay, so I was flying in Southern Minnesota. And let me just point out, here's one of the limitations of this kind of tracking. This is what made it to the internet. If I look at Wasika, let me just zoom in on Wasika and switch over to a satellite view. We launched this from Wasika High School, but the first point that made it to the internet at 1,292 feet, which is about 292 feet off the ground. Minnesota is fairly flat, mostly 1,000 feet above sea level approximately. So the idea is we were already in flight when this information made it to the internet because there must be some ham radio license person in that part of Wasika, okay? That's okay. So I didn't see myself on the ground. I couldn't tell that it was running until after I let it go other than the fact that I used a handheld radio to check that it was running. But worse still, a similar a related problem is that when we were landing, the last point that made it to the internet here, let's see if I can even get a altitude on that point. Oh, sorry, zoom in. Sometimes points, there is 3,700 feet 2221 feet off above sea level. So about 1200 feet above the ground. So this particular object, since I was there, I know where it landed. Not unexpectedly it landed here, which is in the direction it was traveling. But this last point is not the right place to go looking for it. And if this is the last data you have, it's a little hard to figure out where it really landed. Okay, so I always say couple APRS internet tracking with some other method of figuring out where it actually landed if you want to be able to find your stuff. Let's take a look at what is available on the internet from this device. Um, well, first of all, I have all these maps and I can look at them as maps or look at them as aerial views. This particular flight here near the town of Oatana was the peak of the flight, 106,000 feet, 93,000. Oh, that was the burst, okay? So the idea is, here was the last data point that made it to the internet from this tracker. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I'll take it back, 111,000 feet. I was off by one. Here we go, 111,117 feet, 111,934, still going up. 106,000, definitely post burst on the way down. Okay, so here it was at burst, 111,000 feet, and then it came down and landed. Um, I can look at this information on Google Earth. Let me click down here, lower right-hand side, Google Earth KML. That should open up. Try that again. I guess it wants me to save this. I will just save it. Let's see if I can open it from here. There we go. Opening Google Earth, that's a free download. And this will show in 3D what this looked like. I was just looking at it in 2D on the website itself. So I need to zoom in. Southern Minnesota. I'm disappointed. There it is. Okay, so this flight didn't go very far and therefore it's not very big on this map. But here I can see it started here, it went up, it went up, it got fairly high, it burst, it went down, it went down and drifted, it landed here. So for instance, I can look at it, if I tip this over some, I can see the ascent, I can see the burst is here, then the descent. If I want to, I can look at it from the backside. Notice that it 
in 3D at least, uh, it crossed itself. In 2D, it also did. And then this is where it landed. Uh, well, actually, again, this is the last point that made it to the internet. It did not land at that location. It continued on and landed over here. This is the last location that made it to the internet. Let me uh, also look at some raw data. So let me just close Google Earth and look at the raw packets. Oh, I have to log in. So you have to make yourself an account. Let's see if I remember my password for this account. I do. Never save passwords. Okay, here we go. First of all, I wanted to show more than 50 data points because there's more than 50 data points in this record. I'll tell it a thousand. In actuality, I found 178 data points. So here they are. And let's just take a look at what kind of data makes it to the internet. So if I, I highlight some data here, there it is. I see that this was generated by a radio called KD0AWK-2, that's me, that's the transmitting radio. It was posted to the internet by a radio named NOXJA-4. I could look up who that is. That's the name of somebody, the call sign of some ham radio operator. And at this moment in time, it was at a certain latitude north, a certain longitude west, a certain altitude, 16195. That's in feet. 87, okay. That's the transmission number. That's useful because this transmit once a minute. So this is the 87th transmission since it had been turned on. Um, nine is the number of satellites it had in view at that moment in time. 1.55 volts is its battery voltage. Uh, zero Celsius, so it happened to be right at freezing temperature, uh, having been launched from the surface, which was not at freezing, and it's on its way up and it's getting colder. And then 54,399 pascals, that happens to be the pressure at that moment in time. I have, this, this data is a bit hard to deal with. I mean, it's understandable, but it's really handy, and you might do this if you do ballooning a lot, um, to write a parser, some sort of a script that can take this kind of information and automatically make graphs of it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I have a parser. So I've just cut and paste the data. Let me just open up my parser. So this par parser was written by a student of mine. It was written using MATLAB, um, but then he made an executable file. It takes it a while to start up, so I'm, I'm talking while it's starting up. But the executable file means you don't have to have MATLAB on your computer to use the parser. Um, you just have to be patient. So it'll throw a couple errors, which are actually not important. And then it will open up a small box in which I can paste the data that I just, just uh, cut and pasted. I can paste the data there. So here it comes there. Now I want to paste the data and I want to parse the text that I've just pasted. Now that I've parsed it, then I can plot it. So for instance, typically I would plot X axis would be time in minutes and Y axis, vertical axis would be like altitude in feet. And then I say refresh graph, there it is. I see at zero minutes into flight, which is some offset from the packet number, which is minutes since it started, was turned on, okay? Uh, the thing went up at about 50,000 feet or so. It slowed down a little bit and then it continued to go up. This one reached 111,000 feet and then it burst and then it came back down and was slowing as it came down under parachute. Notice there's a couple data points here which are clearly incorrect. So at a couple of times during the transmission, it didn't get the right data or the right data didn't make it all the way to the internet. So don't be fooled by things like that. But this is a pretty standard flight. If I want to look at it in meters, I can just click meters, refresh graph. And I see that this got to about 34 kilometers. If I click pressure and press refresh graph, I see the pressure was high and then it decreased as I flew and then I burst and it went back up as I descended. Perhaps the most interesting thing here is the temperature. If I say refresh graph and temperature, here's what I see. The temperature was reasonably steady early in the flight and then it decreased a lot and got down to about minus 30. This is Celsius. Um, let me change it to Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, refresh graph, same graph, new units, okay? So the idea is when we launched this thing, it was between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it got very cold down to minus 20 or so Fahrenheit. And then it increased, at least according to this thermometer, that's the stratosphere, increasing temperature with increasing altitude. At this point, we burst at the peak of the flight when it was actually perhaps 75 degrees. I'm not sure I believe that, but anyway, it got quite warm. 
and then it went back into the deep freeze, and then it returned to the ground, in which case the temperature rebounded. So notice there are two low temperature points. One is at the tropopause on the way up, and one is at the tropopause on the way down. Also, notice the tropopause on the way down supposedly is colder. If I were to plot rather than minutes versus temperature, let me put altitude on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis and refresh the graph. And so here's what I see. I see a diminishing temperature with increasing altitude and then an increasing temperature in the stratosphere. And then the points are much farther spread out as it's falling fast. And maybe it got a little bit colder on the way down and maybe that was a artifact of how the, me the measurement was made, okay? So I'm not sure I believe that it got colder on the way down, but it was definitely traveling faster and traveling differently and traveling in a slightly different location in the atmosphere. So maybe there's, maybe that's legit and maybe that requires some careful data analysis or thinking about what that data is trying to tell us. But having a parser of this sort is quite useful. Um, anyway, back to it. Stop share. So, um, a simple device, they only weigh about one ounce, including the battery. Um, I often fly two of these on a given flight, as well as other kinds of trackers. Um, not good unless you have a ham radio that can pick up the transmissions line of sight. Not that great for finding things, but definitely good for telling you where it's been, uh, allowing people to monitor you at a distance. Um, you do need a ham radio license to purchase and operate this particular device. And it's handy. Not imperative, but it's handy to have a parser that will automatically take that kind of information of which there is a lot and help you sort it out. Otherwise you can do it by hand. I've certainly done that many times, but um, having a parser is a useful thing. And simple to fly, very lightweight, doesn't even have to go inside of a box, can be added to the stack at the last moment, just more or less taped on the outside. Be careful though, if it's taped on the outside, when it goes through this difficult environmental condition, the tape can get wet, the tape can get not so sticky because it gets cold. So use a lot of tape or figure out another way to mount this device just to make sure it doesn't fall off during a flight. That has happened to me, although it's a tracker. So if it falls off, you'll know where it fell and you might even be able to go there and find it. But it's a pretty small device and if it falls in deep grass, that's kind of hard. Okay, that's it. APRS tracking with a strato track unit. Thanks.